Greetings and welcome back to another exciting episode of Cross Platform, where we compare and contrast different versions of games released within the same generation to see which ones are worth playing and why. Remember that Remake or Rebreak is for subsequent significant re-releases and Cross Platform is for contrasting contemporary releases. While I prefer to focus on different games of the same name, I'm more than willing to cover cross console ports when there's contention as to which is better. Last time we kicked off this new segment with an exhaustive two and a half hour look at Sonic Unleashed. This time around, we're gonna dial it back with the game I reference all the time, but haven't yet reviewed, Glover for the Nintendo 64. Despite owning an N64 as a kid, I spent most of my childhood playing three games, Super Mario 64, Yoshi's Story, and Toy Story 2. Yeah, that's another cross-platform episode waiting to happen. Like most four-year-olds, if I wanted to play more games, my parents had to rent them from the video store. At one point, I rented Glover on the N64. Excited to see what it was all about, I raced upstairs, popped that sucker in, and turned the power on. The opening cutscene played, and I was scared out of my wits. Imagine being four years old and seeing this on the screen. Yeah, nope. Other than that, I can't really remember much of my first playthrough. All I know is that I couldn't read and the mechanics were difficult for my toddler brain to grasp. It wasn't until the summer of 2015 that I decided to try the game again, emulating on Project 64. My first impressions were that I really didn't like the game that much. I found the controls difficult and counterintuitive. The game had plenty of tutorials, but still felt like I was fighting against my better instincts mechanically. I played a few levels and dropped it to replay Banjo-Kazooie instead. Still, there was something about Glover that made me want to try it again. This time, I played the tutorial stage and picked up on a few things I had missed, and finished the game after playing it intermittently for a few weeks. My final verdict was mixed to positive. I enjoyed Glover overall, but thought that there were plenty of instances of rough design left to polish over. Over the next four years, however, I've played this game many times and it only seems to grow on me with every playthrough. When I finally RGB modded my N64 in 2017, I bought a copy of Glover specifically for it. While Glover was originally marketed for and released on the Nintendo 64 in 1998, the game isn't an N64 exclusive. The game was ported to Windows 9X that same year while a PlayStation version hit shelves in 1999. Similarly to Sonic Unleashed, I want to discuss two questions. First, how well does Glover hold up in 2019? Second, do the Windows 9X and PlayStation versions offer any additional content or improvements over the original N64 release? Like last time, I'll nominate the version I recommend the most for cross-platform MVP. This is Glover Cross-Platform. We begin with the story, and already there are plenty of differences to discuss. The game takes place in the mystical Crystal Kingdom, protected by seven magical crystals and a powerful wizard with a pair of magic gloves. The N64 and PC versions make it look like the gloves are his hands, while the PlayStation version shows that he does indeed have human hands underneath those gloves. One day, the wizard is mixing a new potion in his study when a horrible accident causes the wizard to turn to stone and fall to the bottom of his castle. The explosion sends one glove, we'll call him Glover, tumbling out the window while the other glove lands in the cauldron. The explosion causes the kingdom's seven magical crystals to tumble off the castle spires, leading a quick-thinking Glover to transform them into rubber balls to prevent them from shattering. Meanwhile, the other glove emerges from the cauldron, transformed into the fiendish cross stitch. It now falls to Glover to retrieve the seven magic crystals, return balance to the kingdom, defeat cross stitch, and restore the wizard to his original self. It's a simple story for sure, but I appreciate how it manages to avoid the cliched kidnapping plot we've seen in every platforming game ever. More impressive, however, is how the story is set up without any dialogue. Sure, you can consult the manual for the details, but everything you need to know is showcased in the opening cutscene. As I said in my Ocarina of Time review, the purpose of story in gaming is to motivate and contextualize gameplay, and the way that Glover uses visual design to communicate the stakes and light a fire under the player's seat is simply ingenious. The Crystal Kingdom degenerates from a paradise of blue skies and green grass where butterflies roam and birds sing, to a nightmarish hellscape soured by red fog and teeming with spiders and bats. That's not to mention Cross Stitch's deranged cackles ringing through the ether. <laughs> 
These visuals scared me shitless as a youngster, but that's precisely the point. The player instantly understands why retrieving the crystals is important, all without the game having to explain it in words. More ingenious still is how the central hub gradually returns to its original state as you retrieve crystals, complete with music changes. The red fog fades, Cross-Stitch's laughter disappears, the inhabitants return to their former selves, and eventually the beginning of the game becomes nothing more than an unpleasant memory. In a time where games increasingly relied on walls of boring, unskippable text or hokey, poorly translated dialogue, Glover's visual storytelling is refreshing and timeless. The PC version's cutscenes are essentially the same as their N64 brethren, except rendered in these awful smacker video files, which include blank scan lines for some reason. On an old PC monitor, these blank scan lines wouldn't be noticeable, kind of like how 240p games look on a 480i CRT. But in that case, why not just render the files in actual 240p and upscale the 480p. But why pre-render anyway? Usually FMVs showcase state-of-the-art CGI that the hardware can't produce in real time. These are just the N64 cutscenes recorded in an awful codec, so why not just render them in real time? Trust me, I know better than anybody that this game requires a compatible 3D accelerator to look like the N64 version, but I'd still rather the cutscenes match the in-game graphics. Other than that, that the story is identical to the N64 version, with the changes in the hub world staying intact. The PlayStation version, meanwhile, is a bit different. The PS1 FMVs are an improvement on the PC cutscenes, featuring actual CGI and lacking the blank scan lines. Still, these cutscenes kind of look like cheese. Bear in mind, folks, I played both the N64 and PS1 versions on my PVM while recording them for this review, and even on a CRT, the PS1 PS1 cutscenes still look terrible. The underlying CGI looks great, don't get me wrong, but the way they were compressed to fit on a PlayStation disc rubs me the wrong way, especially with that slideshow 10 FPS. Beyond the format, the substance of the story has changed as well. While the N64 and PC cutscenes show that the wizard's failed potion was an accident, the PS1 cutscene implies that the left glove intentionally sabotaged it so he could transform into cross stick. His motivation isn't explained, but I kind of prefer this telling regardless. A plot point in Glover 2 was going to be the left glove tricking Glover into making a potion to turn himself back into Cross Stitch. So the PS1 cutscenes have better continuity with the cancelled sequel. When we boot up a save, however, we quickly discover that the audio and visual changes to the hub world as you collect crystals have been removed completely. What, was there not enough room on the disc or something? The clever visual storytelling of the N64 and PC versions is gone, and the motivation of the player to retrieve the crystals and restore the kingdom disappears with it. <sighs> but I digress. With the story covered, it's time to talk graphics. The N64 version, like most games on the system, runs at a native 313 by 237 within a 320 by 240 frame, with spatial anti-aliasing on some models. A hardware scaler then stretches this raw image to 640 by 240 using bilinear filtering to further anti-alias the image. As always, I played the N64 version of my Sony PVM with my RGB modded Nintendo 64 and pass the RGB signal through to the open source scan converter for recording purposes. Some of you may recall from my Ocarina of Time review that I considered Glover a better looking game from 1998, and I stand by that assessment. The N64 aesthetic is an acquired taste, and a lot of that has to do with the hardware designers optimizing for CRT display technology rather than the digital standard we know today. Still, and maybe this is the nostalgia talking, there is a charm to the look of the models and textures. The games still look dated, of course, and some look better than others, but overall I maintain that Glover is above average for the system. A large part of that is due to Glover having a creative visual style to separate it from the crowd. Just look at some of these character designs and ideas for enemies. Robotic dolphins, aliens with mugs for heads, flying grapes with sunglasses, pink inflatable elephants, Dennis the Space Hopper, bees with big poofy lips, ravenous treasure chests with rows of sharp teeth, love crazed bipedal triceratopsies, hopping dynamite sticks with sunglasses and teeth. Hey look, it's a noble dynamite frolicking in the fields. <laughs> 
so majestic, so peaceful. And don't even get me started on the bosses. Glover himself has an iconic design with his four fingers and stitched on face, and the same goes for the wizard and cross stitch. The creativity of the visuals alone helps them to stand out from games of the time. Still, the game goes a step further with imaginative environmental design. Stage locations range from snowy mountains, Atlantic ruins, haunted castles, a space outpost, volcanoes, and pirate tree houses. As opposed to Ocarina of Time and its drab, featureless overworld, Glover's environments sport a healthy splash of color and contrast that make assets pop off the screen. As expected, Glover uses the N64's trademark bilinear filtering to anti-alias textures. While we get the usual smeary rock and grass textures, Glover does have its fair share of cleverly patterned materials to bring the environments to life, like the carvings in Atlantis, the stripe and zigzag motif of the circus, to the flashy lights and tech of Out of This World. Nevertheless, the visuals come with two major flaws. First, the draw distance is pretty bad. This was an issue in many fifth generation games, but Glover is among the most egregious examples I can think of. While many contemporaries use techniques like MIP mapping, interconnected small environments, and off-screen culling to overcome this issue, Glover uses a static culling technique that basically deloads anything behind the camera and anything 30 feet in front of it. While I didn't notice it much while playing, it definitely stands out in editing. Still, the fact that I didn't notice it too much while playing means the designers did a decent job disguising the issue. Using techniques like fading, dithering, gradients, fog, and fixed camera angles that coincidentally focus away from the calling. In stages like Atlantis or the Fortress of Fear, this actually creates an effective atmosphere. In levels like Pirates or Out of This World, however, the effect isn't as strong, and you can see geometry amateurly appearing out of nowhere. The trade-off is that Glover's frame rate is surprisingly smooth and consistent, which is no small feat on a platform infamous for performance issues even in the best games. Even Rareware, debatably the best developer on the platform, failed to achieve this in many of its hit titles. The caveat is that, like Ocarina of Time, Glover similarly runs at 20 FPS. While playing, I could have sworn it looked like 30, but I verified it was 20 in post. Unlike Ocarina of Time, which suffered from performance drops, Glover consistently delivers a frame every 50 milliseconds, and even 20 FPS can look reasonably smooth with good frame pacing. While recording for the review, I don't think I noticed a single performance drop or instance of micro stutter, which is commendable. Remember that this is all going off my own eyeballs and going through footage frame by frame in post. While there are better looking games in the system for sure, including virtually all of Rare's catalog, Glover is stylized, colorful, and maintains a consistent performance. The Windows version is complicated graphically. In essence, this version is a straight port of the N64 game to Windows 9X, which would be a good thing if Windows 10's backwards compatibility wasn't so damn flaky. Personally, I had no luck running Glover on the Exo Paraputer, even in Windows 98 mode. The game reaches the title screen and chugs. There is an unofficial patch by Donut Grind that disables the CD check and the awful smacker video files, and also includes includes a glide wrapper to play the game on modern GPUs, but I couldn't get it to work. According to Donut Grind, it's kind of 50-50 whether the patch will work on your Windows 10 machine, and with each new update, Microsoft seems to break something new. I tried setting up a virtual machine in PCM, which can emulate Voodoo 2 3D accelerators for better compatibility. Special thanks to the Brickster on Twitter for directing me towards PCM. While I was able to get the game running in Voodoo 2 mode, the game chugged at 10 FPS with plenty of performance drops. Moreover, there are graphical glitches galore. Any sane person would have given up on the 3D acceleration and just played the game in CPU high detail mode, which disables texture filtering and uses a lower quality HUD. <sighs> but unfortunately for the both of us, I'm not sane. So, I bought a Windows 98 rig off of eBay for $200. Introducing the ExoParaputer 98, which comes with the 450 MHz Pentium 3 processor, 
128 megabytes of RAM, a 40 gigabyte IDE hard drive, and a 32 megabyte ATI Rage Pro 128 graphics card. Since the GPU outputs an RGB HV through VGA, all I have to do is connect the computer to the OSSC and voila! Let's play some Glover. Alright, I'll just select ATI Rage Pro from the GPU list here and apparently the Rage Pro 128 isn't backwards compatible? Okay, so I bought a 4 megabyte Diamond Monster 3D2 off eBay along with the Matrox Millennium G400 2D card. Then I'll use a special VGA cable to daisy chain the two cards together. Alright, so we'll go ahead and boot Glover and see it works. Sort of. For whatever reason, I get a lot of interference in the signal from the Diamond card, which is surprising since all the VGA cables are triple shielded. After monkeying with the OSSC settings for an hour, I managed to minimize the analog jitter. There's still interference in the image, so please excuse the shoddy video quality. So after all that time and money, we're finally playing Glover on PC like it's 1998. And it's fine. I'm not kidding when I say that Glover on PC with the 3 the accelerator is literally just the N64 version on Windows. The biggest difference is that the game runs in 640 by 480, making for a noticeably sharper picture. Unfortunately, even with the compatible 3D card and a Pentium 3, the game still runs in 20 FPS, along with a barrage of micro stutter and performance drops. Other than that, little has changed. It's the same models, environments, and textures you remember on the N64. I'm not really familiar familiar with the graphical standards of Windows 9X games in 1998, but I have to imagine Glover PC would have been capable of higher resolution textures or at least a consistent 30 FPS. Apparently they had time to draw a worse looking HUD for the CPU mode, but still had to upscale the original HUD to 480p. Couldn't they have at least increased the draw distance a little bit? If anything, they made it worse. All the techniques used to disguise the color are gone, meaning assets just suddenly materialize on screen throughout the entire game, and not just in pirates or space. To give the PC version its due credit, I did notice that the draw distance fog has been removed from the central hub, which is nice, but I would have liked to see that in the actual stages as well. The fact that this is more or less a straight port with minimal PC enhancements and a worse frame rate is disappointing. Perhaps buying a second Diamond Monster 3D2 and connecting them with SLI would enhance the performance or frame rate, but frankly, I've already spent enough trying to play this game already. That brings us to the PlayStation version, which came out a year later. This version takes a page from Crash Spyro and Pac-Man World and running at an anamorphic 512 by 240 Since CRTs lack the fixed horizontal resolution, anamorphic games look fantastic on them, but that also means my Frame Meister footage from my Pac-Man World Roar didn't have perfect pixels. Well, guess I've gotta delete it now. Like with the N64 version, I'm using RGB SCART, playing on the PVM, and digitizing with the OSSC. I used Linksos to correct the aspect ratio in post, and the results are quite nice. In my opinion, the PS1 version is the best looking of the three, even if it's in the middle in terms of resolution. Besides the resolution, the colors appear more vibrant here than on N64. The HUD has been redrawn and looks great. Like most PS1 games, the textures lack filtering and suffer wriggling, and you have occasional Z-buffer errors with objects rendering in the wrong order, but that just kind of comes with the territory. The environments are largely the same with some minor changes I'll discuss later. In addition to the lack of bilinear filtering, a lot of the texture work appears lower res or is replaced outright on PlayStation. Like Crash and Spyro, we've got plenty of diamond-shaped dithering patterns to look at here, and it's just classic PS1. The character models are mostly the same, but do have subtle G geometrical or texture differences I didn't notice until editing. I did notice that the Orbot looking grape enemies were replaced with Darth Maul looking ones in Space 2. By my eyes, the draw distance on PS1 is the best. Not just because it seems to go a bit farther, but because this version does a better job disguising the culling. I also really dig the new skyboxes especially, which give me serious Spyro vibes. The one thing that looks worse in my opinion are the animations, particularly 
Leon Glover himself, which look janky and awkward. Of course, there wasn't much they could do, given the fact that the PS1 version once again runs at 20 FPS, along with performance drops and micro stutters similar to the PC version, only perhaps worse. Crash and Spyro managed a consistent 30 FPS at 512 wide by chopping off scan lines that would have been hidden in the overscan area anyway. Nobody in 1998 would have noticed those missing 24 lines. But for whatever reason, the Glover PS1 team decided to keep them and had to lower the frame rate to compensate. While I still think the PS1 version is the prettiest of the three, personally I think the N64 version has the best balance of visuals and performance overall. Fact is, 20 FPS isn't abnormal for N64. Most PlayStation games, meanwhile, consistently hit that 30 FPS benchmark, so Glover PS1 failing to maintain even a consistent 20 makes it an odd duck. That brings us to the soundtrack, composed by Rob Lord, Paul Weir, and Mark Bandola. This soundtrack has really grown on me over the years. It's worth noting that the PC PS1 streamable soundtrack is the original work, which was then sequenced on the N64. Lover's soundtrack is really jazzy, with prominent slap bass, pipe organ, piano, and flute. Each stage has its own theme, which was ambitious for a linear stage-based game in the late 90s. Each of the game's six worlds has a unique motif that builds off the jazzy bass with the pirate levels incorporating accordion, the circus levels bringing in horns and brass, and the fear levels using harpsichord and staccato on violins. Perhaps the best tracks in the game come from the first world, Atlantis, which has a deep, atmospheric sound that piggybacks well in the game's opening sequence. The space levels are another highlight with some creative instrument choices, including the cliched theremin. I could describe the tracks all day, so let's take a listen to a few highlights. In terms of audio fidelity, the PC soundtrack is the best, at streamed, uncompressed 44.1 kHz 16-bit stereo, while the N64 version is the lowest, at 22.05 kHz 16-bit stereo sequenced. Despite that, I think the sound team did an excellent job recreating the pieces on the N64. Overall, I'm starting to come around in the PC soundtrack being my favorite of the two, but I still think the N64 Atlantis tracks turned out better than the original PC renditions for their superior atmosphere. The PS1 soundtrack is the PC soundtrack, only encoded with the PS1's proprietary compressed 37.8 kHz.xa format. Strangely, the PS1 version sports a track for Prehistoric 1 that's completely different from the N64 version. The cat 
in fact, the PC version literally uses a recorded version of the N64 song in the stage. Not sure what happened there. The biggest downside to the PC and PS1 versions is that they stream the audio from the CD and have a hard time looping properly. Meaning, you often get performance drops at loop points or dead air while the game reloads the audio. <laughs> Since the N64 soundtrack is sequenced, you don't have that problem. In any event, I think the music in this game is great and an unappreciated gem from the era. To briefly remark on the sound design, I did notice that the quality of the sound effects is lower on PlayStation than on N64, and given the storage media, you'd expect it to be the other way around. Another thing that cheeses me off is that they replaced Cross Stitch's trademark cackle with some stock sound effect that would make Spyro a hero's tail blush. <laughs> <laughs> Which finally brings us to the gameplay. As you'd expect, you control Glover as he tries to retrieve the kingdom's seven magic crystals, all while navigating 18 stages and facing off with six bosses. Unlike many late 90s 3D platformers, which tended to ape off Mario 64, Glover is a stage-based free-roaming 3D platformer where the goal is simply to get the crystal to the end of the stage, while defeating enemies and solving puzzles. Glover on his own controls typically for a 3D platformer, but things get more complicated the moment you grab the crystal, transformed into a rubber ball. The controls are likely the greatest barrier to entry for new players. No game really plays like Glover, and while Billy Hatcher comes close, that was easier to pick up and play in my opinion. When I played this game in Project 64 in 2015, it just felt like all the buttons were mapped to the wrong places and that I couldn't get the ball to go where I wanted it. That's why I highly recommend first time players check out the optional tutorial stage in the well next to the castle. Here, the wizard's hat, Mr. Tip, will walk you through the basic controls and teach you some advanced maneuvers. As Glover, A jumps, B points to the ball, or grabs it if it's next to a hazard, which is helpful. A plus Z fist slams and B plus R transforms the ball from a distance. Glover can also cartwheel by tapping Z, but this is only used once in the entire game and is even removed in the PS1 version. More annoying, it locks your controls for a bit afterwards, which is frustrating when you just want a fist slam. Seems pretty self-explanatory so far. While holding the ball, B now jumps slash dribbles. Holding B allows you to throw the ball with a little reticle showing you where the ball will go, while pressing A does a quick aerial throw and holding it lets you slap the ball across pits. If you ask me, dribble should be mapped to the A button since that's the jump button when playing as just Glover, while slap should be mapped to B since that's the action button in most platforming games. Other maneuvers include tapping Z to let go of the ball, the R button to transform the ball while holding it, and L to get on top of the ball. While balancing on the ball, your movement is inverted, perhaps to make the player's movement feel precarious and unbalanced. To a first-time player, however, the inversion comes out of nowhere. While standing on the ball, you can fist slam to use the ball as a makeshift trampoline and reach optional goodies. I finished the N64 game a good five times, and at this point the controls feel as natural as breathing. I can time dribbles, aim the ball, move on top of the ball, and transform like nobody's business. But I haven't forgotten what my first play experience with this game felt like. Speaking of transforming, Glover can use his magic to transform the crystal into a rubber ball, a bowling ball, and a ball bearing. Each form has different properties that are used to defeat certain enemies, destroy walls, sink underwater, magnetize, bounce in the air, and even double points from collectibles. As you explore the levels, you have to think about which form will work best in that situation. Along the way, Glover will encounter an assortment of kooky baddies, each stranger than the last. With the exception of the grapes and the few other enemies, Glover can't actually defeat most of them, meaning you'll have to practice avoiding enemies rather than fighting them directly. You might say he's more of a Glover than a fighter. Glover has a three heart life bar and can die from fall damage. The ball can take three hits as well, with the crystal breaking if it so much as touches a wall too fast. Other hazards like bottomless pits or electricity can destroy any form instantly, even though rubber doesn't conduct electricity but what 
whatever. The only other thing to cover in terms of play mechanics are the magic spells, temporary power-ups that each show up exactly twice in the game. These do things like enlarge Glover so he can push heavy objects, transform enemies into frogs so you can squash them, allow Glover to fly while carrying the ball, retrieve the ball from a distance, and transform the rubber ball into a super bouncy beach ball. All interesting ideas that unfortunately don't get used much. Personally, the core mechanics of platforming and transforming the ball are more than enough to carry the game for me, but I would have liked to see the spells expanded upon. A common criticism with a lot of these fifth generation games is the camera control. Even the best games of the era fall down somewhere. If you ask me, Glover on N64 is better than average in this regard. Unlike Mario 64 or Banjo-Kazooie, camera rotation isn't quantized to awkward increments. Simply hold left to right C and the camera will rotate continuously. It's as simple as that. And unlike Mario 64, I found that the camera had plenty of room to rotate most of the time. The game also makes use of the occasional fixed camera angle to make maneuvering a bit easier. Unfortunately, the camera isn't totally free of 5th generation jank. I did run into a few instances where the camera got caught on walls, and the fact that you can't use the first person mode to refocus the camera is really annoying in these rare circumstances. Moving on to the PC version, the controls are virtually identical to the N64 original with a few differences. If you're playing with the keyboard, you can remap the controls to any key you want, though getting on top of the ball and pausing are locked to F12 and escape respectively. Your key assignments are displayed in the pause menu for quick reference, so basically they tried everything they could to keep you from getting confused. Thankfully, the game does support controllers, but you'll need a custom driver to use an Xbox controller in Windows 98. However, the driver appears limited to the left stick, the bumpers, and the face buttons. Between all of these things, I was able to map the controls close to the N64 original and restore analog movement. However, without support for the triggers or right stick, I was kind of screwed as far as camera goes. I ended up using the bumpers for fist slam and transform respectively, while putting camera zoom on wire B. This meant, however, that I had to rotate the camera, pause the game, and get on top of the ball with the keyboard, which was an idea. Deal. The point is that controller and keyboard configurations should have been separate so you could map every command to a controller and not just some of them. Also, right stick support would have been nice. The PS1 version is a different story and it's kind of a double-edged sword compared to the N64 and PC versions. For one thing, I think the button mappings are more intuitive and easier to learn, such as mapping dribbling to the jump button and uninverting ball running. Seeing as the Glover 2 team did the same for the unreleased sequel, it's clear the designers backpedaled on weird choices from the 1998 release. Glover PS1 supports the DualShock controller, and while L1 and R1 rotate the camera, the PS1 team had the foresight to use the right stick for full analog camera control. Unfortunately, you can't invert the stick on the X or Y axes, which is a pet peeve of mine in early dual analog games. Speaking of analog, I found overall that the left stick was a bit more responsive than on the N64. Then again, it might just be my Brawler 64 coloring that opinion. The ball running feature even seems to work better with water, seeing as Glover won't slip off the ball when it hits the surface. Additionally, the hub world has been integrated with the tutorial stage, and now has Garabs to collect. Oddly enough, the wizard's hat, Mr. Tip, has been replaced with generic question marks. Okay. The PS1 version in general does a much better job explaining how the mechanics work and even how to fight the bosses, making it overall more accessible to newcomers. There's even a convenient move list displayed on the left side of the screen. And yes, you can switch it on and off with the select button. Also nice is that previously undamageable enemies can now be killed on PS1 by slapping the bowling ball onto them. It's minor, but very helpful in Prehistoric 1. Despite all these improvements, the new control controls otherwise feel worse in my opinion. The ground pound has been moved from the left trigger to the square button, which works, but isn't as intuitive. L2 still lets go of the ball at least, but because L1 rotates the camera, you have to press L2 and cross to get on top of the ball, a button combination I had to look up in the manual. The physics and movement just feel sluggish and unresponsive compared to N64, especially the jump and dribble physics. I also find that it takes much longer to transform the ball this time around, unless you press R2 in an exact rhythm that's hard to explain. Also weird is that you're supposed to get bonus points
coins from Garab's if you collect them while holding the ball, which doubles from there with the crystal. It's a great risk reward system for racking up extra men. While the crystal was always fragile on N64, hence the risk side of the equation, I swear you can break it on PS1 just by breathing on it too hard. Seriously, the amount of times it shattered for no good reason is just too many to count, and it really grinds my gears. You're also not allowed to transform the ball in midair or while in shallow water. Why? Perhaps most annoying is that the throwing and slapping aim is inverted here, which is so awkward that at first I thought the aim was locked to eight directions. While the PS1 controls are easier to learn than on N64, I feel like the N64 version has the superior movement and physics, and therefore play better once you get used to the button layouts. Moving on to level design, stages are 3D obstacle courses where you take the crystal from point A to point B. Most stages are linear romps, though there are a few instances where the developers got creative with the stage structure. For example, Prehistoric 3 forks into three sections from the start point, with switches opening the next path at the end of each fork. Carnival 1 similarly involves a series of platforming and puzzle sections ending with a switch that opens the path to the end of the stage. Perhaps my favorite is Space 2, where you press a couple switches to open the route to the end of the stage, only to then open a door at the beginning of the stage and rush to the other end within the time limit. This kind of variation in linear stage design is exactly what I was talking about in my Pac-Man world roar. 3D space allows for more variation in how designers can build stages, all the while retaining linearity, and something like Prehistoric 3 is an excellent example. That's probably the most credit I can give Glover, unfortunately, because while I really enjoy playing it, there's not a lot of substance to analyze here. The platforming? It's pretty basic, but also not annoying. The puzzles? There's some clever moments here and there, but still nothing that'll burst your brain cells. The combat? Well, the game encourages you to avoid enemies, so that's out. The spells? They're only used two or three times a piece. The game does have a competent difficulty curve, at least, with Atlantis being basic and the space levels putting you through your paces. Still, there are some instances of baffling and even frustrating design Surprise, that I feel deserve mention. There are these dynamite critters wandering around, and they'll kill you instantly unless you duck. That's simple enough, but the explosion will also push your ball around, possibly into spikes or bottomless pits, and the blast radius is ludicrously massive. Thankfully, the PS1 version was nice enough to remove these nuisances altogether. In the space levels, there are these alien dudes that will suck up your ball, turn it back to crystal, and then launch it into the sky. If you can't catch it in time, the crystal will shatter and you'll lose a life. Space 3 immediately begins by setting one of these douchebags on top of a ball switch. I'm still not sure what the designers expected you to do here, so by my PC run, I just used a cheat to kill him with the death spell and move on. Speaking of which, while the PC level design is virtually identical to that of the N64, the PS1 stages have their share of minor differences. By and large, they're structurally similar to their N64 counterparts, retextures and minor geometry differences aside. However, there are still cases where certain platforms were replaced, and most of these changes really aren't worth talking about and don't affect the play experience, though there are a few I probably should mention. The end of Carnival 3 on N64 and PC feature these large spinning tubes reminiscent of Pac-Man World. On PS1, however, this has been replaced with a series of small spinning platforms, which also reminds me of PMW. Also in Carnival 3, this platform that required a lift from Dennis is now much shorter and easier to jump over. However, you could also use the fist slam ball to bounce over it, so it's not that big a deal in my opinion. Finally, in Pirates 1, you had to think about your forms and push against this jet stream to press an underwater switch in the 1998 version. On PlayStation, these jet streams are much weaker, therefore defeating the point of the puzzle. Personally, I think stage changes like these aren't that big of a deal. The new physics are the real problem here, and I found myself breaking certain sections that required thought and effort before, so maybe I haven't given the N64 level design enough credit. Thankfully, like most of these kinds of platformers, there's optional side content in the form of Garabs. These tarot card looking things you can nab for points and extra lives. Speaking of which, this is one of the few games I know with a three digit lives counter. Anyways, to 100% the game, you'll need to collect every Garab in every stage. And like Yoshi's Island or Crash Box Gems, you'll need to get all of the Garabs in one per 
perfect run of the stage. This is made slightly harder on the PS1, where the gear up count per stage has increased over the 1998 release. While the game does provide a convenient gear up counter, and while most of the garabs are out in the open where the explorative player will find them, there are those well hidden ones that might require breaking out a guide. Right in the first level, there's this pillar with garabs inside it that you have to knock over by jumping into it, but there's no indication that that's what you're supposed to do. This isn't the only time Glover does this, with later stages including knockable objects in the beaten path. The PS1 version is nice enough to tutorialize this mechanic, but in the 1998 version, it's not communicated well at all. The second level has a bunch of garabs hidden on a cliff, so I hope you know about the secret trampoline move. There are also times where there are unmarked breakable walls, or platforms hidden in the draw distance fog that first time players are guaranteed to miss. One thing that I love about Glover is that you're allowed to warp back to any checkpoint from the pause menu at any time. Kind of like Shadow the Hedgehog. So if you missed a Garab earlier in the stage or just want a shortcut for speedrunning purposes, it's really helpful. Why modern platformers never took note of such a basic feature, I'll never know. The game's easy mode lets you locate Garabs by holding R, but the catch is that you can't play the bonus levels, which are your reward for collecting all the Garabs. Yeah, I don't know what they were thinking. Despite these issues, I find that collecting all the Garabs is intrinsically rewarding and it makes stages more fun to play on the whole. What can I say? I'm a completionist and I enjoyed completing these main stages. Collecting all the Garabs in a world on the PS1 also expands your life bar by one heart, an idea that would have carried over to Glover 2 as well. Well, that sounds great, I find that I mostly die from instant kill hazards. And this game emphasizes dodging enemies anyway, so three hearts on N64 and PC was plenty. As for the bonus stages themselves, well, they're inconsistent in quality to say the least. The very first one is this Frogger knockoff where Cross Stitch transforms you into a frog. You gotta jump across these floating platforms and reach the goal. Bear in mind that in order to 100% Glover, you need to beat the stage in the time limit and collect all 25 Garabs. While that sounds simple, the controls are anything but. You'd think the game would quantize movement to units based on the frog jumps, but no. You're locked to eight direct movement but don't snap into place, which makes it more difficult to time jumps and can lead to slipping off of platforms in some instances. While most players will discover the long jumps with A, they probably won't figure to try smaller hops with B, which you'll need to reach edges of logs without jumping into the water, or to use Z to lick up garabs and insects for extra lives. It looks easy, but it took me 30 minutes to do it on both N64 and PC. The PS1 team removed it from the game and entirely and replaced it with the straightforward timed run up an Atlantean pyramid. Much better. While the Frogger stage is the worst in the game, the rest of the bonus stages don't improve by terribly much. The Circus stage is a shooting gallery where you shoot Garabs and moving targets under a time limit. If you input a special secret cheat in the pause menu, the game will replace the textures with pictures of the designers. Unlike the Frogger level, this stage keeps the controls simple, making the experience more satisfying, though the lack of a reticle raises my eyebrow. The pirate bonus stage involves destroying these barrels to flood the shaft so you can reach the top, all the while collecting Garabs. The time limit is a little tight, so I recommend sticking to the middle and using the balls as stepping stone to the other platforms. In the PS1 version, the jet stream in the middle won't take you all the way to the top for some reason, so you have to keep transforming the ball so you can ride it back up, which is just damn tedious. Next up, we have the prehistoric bonus stage, which is about as much fun as S-ranking Sonic Unleashed. You control the ball directly in the stage while running away from a tide of lava that will kill you instantly. Again, you have to collect all of the Garabs to get 100%, which is annoying when the ball won't stop bouncing around. I swear this stage is even worse than the PC version, to the point that getting all the Garabs seems impossible, while finishing it on the N64 feels luck-based. The PS1 version slows down the lava and removes the instant kill, allowing me to clear it in two tries. Next we have a Pac-Man inspired bonus stage where you run around a maze collecting garabs while dodging ghosts. Like the prehistoric bonus, you play as the ball itself, which is annoying because it bounces off of walls if you move too fast. Additionally, the camera angle is unhelpful and makes it hard to see which garabs you're missing, making it more likely you'll run out the clock. The PS1 version allows the ghost to transform the ball from a distance, and more than once they turned me into 
a crystal while I was moving toward a wall, leading to a surprise death. Surprise, motherfucker! Finally, we come to the space bonus, which uses the helicopter potion one last time. You fly around a room and collect garabs. Enough said. The only difference on PS1 is that you work with a fixed camera angle that makes the stage slightly more annoying to play. So overall, the PS1 version breaks bonus stages just as often as it improves them. And you'd hope that with the extra year of development that all of the stages would be better. Even the better bonus stages aren't that fun to play and are hardly a good extrinsic reward for collecting all the garabs. However, 100%ing the game does reward you with the selection of secret cheats and the credits you can input in the pause menu, which is a decent reward as far as 100% goes. The PS1 version does make it slightly more annoying by waiting a while after the credits to show the cheat list. As bad as the bonus stages are, I'd call the bosses the worst part of the game because they're required. The challenge mostly comes down to figuring out how to actually fight them, and when when you do, they practically beat themselves. Part of that is a sort of puzzle aspect, but the other part is poor communication on the game's behalf. For example, the first part of the Atlantis boss has a ball symbol on it, so you know you're supposed to slap the ball onto it to damage it. The other parts lack a fist slam symbol, so you wouldn't know that you're supposed to fist slam them to inflict damage. In the case of the orangutan boss, you better know about the quick slap feature, which you trigger by dribbling and tapping A. The game never tells you about this quick slap ability. If you have to slow down to time a throw, the orangutan will jump up the tree and pummel you before you can land a hit. The bottom of the barrel, however, is the Frankenstein's monster boss. He's the most legitimately challenging, yes, but also the most frustrating. When I played this game in 2015, I distinctly remember getting mad offline. Basically, you have to fist slam these platforms to form a path up to the boss's kill switch, which you activate by dropping the ball on it. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, the monster is coated in electricity, which will instantly pop your ball, by the way. Thus, you'd want to dribble the ball up to the top and leave it in a safe place, but the boss will periodically kick the walls and knock it down, which is just annoying. This boss is so irritating that the PS1 team actually improved it by increasing the size of the platforms and removing the boss's ability to pop the ball. Before that, you have the T-Rex boss, which is stupidly easy if you take advantage of the snowball mechanic and the clown boss, which you could beat with your eyes closed. Ah, oh, spoiler alert! Even the final boss with Cross Stitch is just a robot shootout. Which sounds great, except some of the attacks seem unavoidable, and dying picks you up where you left off, so it just becomes a bum rush to kill the boss before you game over. Also annoying in the PC version is that if you take damage during the boss defeated cinematic, the game will lock up and force you to refight Cross Stitch all over again. Seems like something that should have been caught in playtesting if you ask me. The PS1 version adds tutorials for each boss, which eliminates the confusion, but also makes these puzzle-based bosses redundant. It's a poor selection of boss fights no matter how you slice it. The last thing to mention in Glover is the time trial mode, accessible from the main menu. In previous reviews, I've glossed over similar modes like this, but I thought I'd give it an honest shot for review's sake and was pleasantly surprised. Essentially, the developers have set a par time to clear for each stage, and if if you win, you get to enter your initials and your time will become the new par for next time. So if you happen to share a cart with siblings, you could challenge each other to see who could clear stages the fastest. More importantly, it's an excellent test of your mastery and knowledge of each stage. Seeing as I usually do an all Garab run, I was surprised to see just how quickly you can plow through most stages when you just focus on getting to the end. There's nothing more satisfying than cheesing stages in ways the developers never intended, beating stages in record time. On the the flip side, playing these stages on a time crunch and without checkpoints really highlights the game's rougher design choices, and I imagine a less experienced player who lacked advanced knowledge of certain hazards would find it frustrating. I do appreciate that the restart option is quick and painless, unlike a certain game I reviewed. Bottom line, I had fun with this mode, but I imagine less experienced players would find it frustrating. The PS1 version, meanwhile, removes the time trial mode entirely. 
And that brings us to our conclusion. Cross-platform. How well does Glover hold up in 2019, and which versions would I recommend, if any? Let's start by discussing the N64 version as a game on its own. I have my fair share of guilty pleasures, and for once I'm not talking about Camp Buddy. These are games that are heavily flawed by my own definition, yet I enjoy them anyway. Games like Zelda 1, the original Star Fox, half the Sonic series, etc. Glover fits neatly into that category for me. Of course it's not without its high points. The story is effective for what it is, and the use of visuals to communicate the stakes is admirable. The graphics, while not the best the generation had to offer, are vibrant and imaginative. The soundtrack offers a jazzy take on traditional video game archetypes, and can be eerily atmospheric at times. I also appreciated the designer's willingness to shake up stage structure once in a while. Nevertheless, Glover is riddled with flaws and downright terrible design at points. The controls are difficult to learn and have some counterintuitive design. The puzzle and platforming design is just kind of average. The draw distance is noticeably poor even for the time. While the game avoids micro stutter, consistent 20 FPS is still 20 FPS. The bosses are either difficult for the wrong reasons, or are so easy that they might as well not be there. The bonus stages range from okay to bad to that frustrating Frogger knockoff. This game is kind of mediocre, so why can't I stop playing it? Three words, Sega Learning Curve. If you recall from my Unleashed review, I argued as others have that Sega tends to take more design risks than the likes of Nintendo, who tend to fall back on things they know will work. The downside is that many of Sega's games include strange mechanics, awkward controls, or other off-putting design choices that can hamper first-time players' enjoyment. On the other hand, repeat players will find games with lots of depth or advanced movement tech. Like I've said, the Sega Learning Learning curve isn't an excuse for games that get better when you know what you're doing, but rather an acknowledgement that we enjoy certain games because we've played them enough to work around their flaws, and we're not necessarily wrong for liking them in spite. While Glover ranks lower on the SLCO meter than something like Mario Sunshine or Sonic Adventure 2, I do feel like it crosses over into that category somewhat. The controls give a bad first impression, but feel good once you've mastered them, and I'm learning new tricks to improve runs of the game with every playthrough. The stage design might be kind of mediocre, but they're still fun to speedrun, with all the garabs or in the time trial mode. So yeah, I understand why this game has something of a cult following among people who grew up with it, just as well as I understand people who dislike it completely. Glover is just one of those games. That said, do the Windows or PlayStation versions offer any improvements or additions over the original Nintendo 64 release? By all rights, the Windows version should should be the best of the three, seeing as the stronger hardware should allow for better draw distance and improved frame rate, enhanced textures or HUD assets, etc. Besides increasing the internal resolution to 640x480 in the CD quality soundtrack, the PC version suffers from poor performance in limited control customization while retaining all the flaws of the N64 version. Apart from that, the poor compatibility with Windows 10 and the absence of a patch that works on all machines means that I basically had to build a Windows 98 rig just to get this game running reasonably well in 2019. Of course, I could have played it in one of the CPU only modes, but that means poor textures, HUD elements, and frame rate, while virtual machines have their own emulation issues. The poor Windows 10 compatibility isn't necessarily the game's fault, since the devs designed for what the game would play on in 1998, but it nevertheless creates a huge barrier to entry for a version that boasts few improvements over its N64 cousin best to skip on this version. As for the 1999 PS1 version, it's clear that the designers took feedback from the 1998 release to heart in its attempts to fix on issues with the original. Several of the bonus stages feature improvements of the N64 equivalents. The tutorials do a much better job explaining how certain mechanics and level gimmicks work. Some of the less intuitive control choices are rectified in PlayStation. They even cleaned up the Frankenstein's monster boss fight over the frustrating original. On top of that, the PlayStation version features the best visuals 
of all three games, higher resolution graphics than N64, better draw distance, full analog camera control, and a lossy version of the PC soundtrack. As much as I will defend this PlayStation port and recognize where it improves, it still has its share of negative points. Half of the bonus stages are worse than on N64. The bosses are over-explained to the point of defeating the purpose of the puzzle-based design. The animations look jerky and unnatural, and the CGI cutscenes have aged like milk. Additionally, the time trial mode was removed completely, and the visual storytelling in the hub world was removed for no discernible reason. This is also a rare example of a game that runs worse on PlayStation than it does on N64, failing to deliver so much as a consistent 20 FPS due to micro stutter and other performance drops. Most importantly, the play control just doesn't feel as smooth or natural as it did on N64 or PC. With floaty jumps, longer transformation speeds, awkward aiming controls, etc. Overall, I'd nominate the Nintendo 64 version for cross-platform MVP almost by default. It's more accessible to play in 2019 than the PC version, and the drawbacks of the PS1 version outweigh the improvements in my opinion. Glover is a flawed little game I enjoy replaying, but not one you need to rush to play yourself. If what you saw in this review interests you, I recommend picking it up on N64 specifically. Before I close out, I want to quickly address the unreleased sequel, Glover 2 for the Nintendo 64. Unfortunately, this sequel was cancelled because Hasbro pulled an E.T. on Atari by ordering more Glover 1 carts than retailers were willing to buy. Meaning that even though the game sold almost a million copies, it still came at a loss. Hasbro canned the sequel shortly after, and that's a shame because going off the leaked betas swirling online, it had interesting ideas to say the least. The gameplay was going to be more open world, you could learn different spells and cast them whenever you wanted, and the storytelling took more of a page from Banjo-Kazooie games. <laughs> While I'm not sure what the final product would have played like, I'm intrigued by its willingness to expand on the original, and I'm disappointed it never saw the light of day. Sometimes, all it takes is a good sequel to turn a decent game into an amazing one, and I believe Glover 2 very well could have been one of those sequels. The original Glover had a lot of great ideas and was onto something, it just didn't get the second game it needed to polish the design and make something truly great. Thankfully, a little studio called Pico Interactive seems to think the same. You might might recognize these guys as the ones who rescued the cancelled N64 port of 40 Winks and gave it an official physical release in April 2019. While I haven't played much of my copy yet, I've heard good things about it. Pico later announced plans to complete and release Dragon Sword on N64 as well, and apparently have plans to do the same for Glover 2. The incomplete beta builds look like they have a lot of ends unfinished, and who knows if any of the original designers will be involved to realize the original vision, but it's encouraging to see a game like Glover 2 get a second chance in the 2010s. If the game comes out, I'll be sure to let you guys know what I think of it. Even so, I think that Glover was onto something, and I'd like to see someone do something with these ideas and improve them. Apparently that other German company that announced a Switch sequel didn't actually exist, so their spiritual successor is off the table. And that's all I've got. I won't say what's coming out next because I've learned my lesson on that front. If you liked today's review, make sure to give it a like and consider subscribing for more. You can also find me on the Unverse cast, where I meet up with Hadox, Ryrule, and King K to talk about video games and read bad fanfiction. You can find video versions of the podcast on YouTube and an audio version on SoundCloud and iTunes. I also have a Let's Play channel, EPG Plays, where I offer informative playthroughs on games I like and some I don't. It's also the new home of Zebro's Play, sillier playthroughs I do with my brother. Principal oh, Crow. Oh, it, you airhead. I don't know what's tough for you, but I'll play dumb with me. I've seen you walking around town. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on, stars. stop. Stop. Pete? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, continue. <laughs> well, Pete? Now I'm doing the asking <laughs> to be a good girl. Are we doing and this the whole game? You know? Yes. Right now. Be sure to go check those out. Until next time, I'm Exaparadigm Gamer, and I hope you enjoyed the review.